So now, now come the ag or the dairy facts. I like to pepper dairy facts uh, for our audience because we have, you know, just it's, it's really a cross section of of everybody on on the on the Zoom call today. Excuse me, on the meeting today. And uh, some of these things, even if you've been around dairy for a really long time, you may not know these know the these facts. So. Um, did you know that Wisconsin is home to 1.3 million cows? Sounds like a lot of cows, but did you know that that's half the number of cows that were in Wisconsin around 1950? And yet, we produce record amounts of milk every year, um, really kind of uh, going to the fact that we are doing much more with less every year. And I think that's a really nice segue to some of the speakers you're gonna hear from today because they are all about stewarding land and water resources. And um, remember, if you have questions for these folks, go ahead and type them into the chat function for our last uh, speakers. You guys are really great about using that, so go ahead and, and keep popping them in there. Our, uh, our first speaker that we have for you today is uh, Matt Akins from the Marshfield Ag Research Station. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Maria. Good to be with you today. So today uh, I'll be discussing a project that was funded through the Innovation Hub. Um, really focusing on a, uh, a uh, forage mixture that's been become popular, uh, especially in the northeastern part of Wisconsin, and it's slowly spreading throughout the state. Um, so I'll be talking about a, a cocktail forage mix uh, project that we did uh, that focused on looking at the uh, yield quality and then the use in lactating cow diets. I just want to thank the, the collaborators, Jamie Patton, um, and Mike, um, uh, Kevin Jarrett, and Mike Balwig. Uh, those were really important as far as coordinating the, the on-farm parts of this, this study at Peninsula ARS and at the, the um, cooperating dairies. So really appreciative. And also Erin Kamen, she was an uh, intern from uh, Platteville, uh, did an excellent job with the, uh, with the project and collecting data. So want to recognize her efforts in this project. So, uh, so this project evaluated the yield and quality of an annual cocktail mix uh, at two different sites. So our plot studies were uh, looked at, um, established these uh, mixes. And there's a mixture of uh, BMR, Southern Sedan grass, uh, Italian ryegrass, uh, and ha hairy vetch, red clover, and bursine clover. And the sorghum dangus is, is meant to get the initial yields, and then the Italian ryegrass uh, and the other uh, legumes really are uh, the second and third cutting yields. Um, so in these plot studies, we evaluated um, a, a couple of different parameters. We looked at the uh, spacing of these uh, of the uh, different seeds. Uh, and we looked at either a narrow or a wide spacing, a seven and a half versus a 15 inch spacing. And then we looked at different depths because we know that the, especially the legumes like to be, have a little shallower depth of, of seeding. So we wanted to see how that might affect the uh, establishment of these mixes. And we also have added four different uh, red clover species or varieties, sorry because uh, there's some varieties of red clover that are, have been um, produced in the southern United States that are a bit more uh, productive in their first year of, of growth. So we wanted to compare those uh, to more Midwestern varieties. Um, and then we also collected on meat data from four different um, dairy farms um, from Sheboygan, Autogamy, O'Connell, and Marathon County. So I'm not going to be presenting data at this time because uh, we are still working on that. But if you click back, Maria, I just wanted to go through a couple of those photos. Thank you. 
So you can see on the, the left hand side, that's um, Aaron and, and Cameron and, and Matt from the Peninsula ARS. They're getting the plots established. Um, and then the next photo over to the right is uh, actually us harvesting at the Marshfield uh, Research Station. Um, so we do a plot yield on each, each plot and then we grab a sample from each of those. So you can't really tell from that photo the predominant um, species that's growing in that first cutting is going to be that southern sedan grass. And then if you look at the next photo is from second cutting at Marshfield. And it's more of a mix of the southern sedan grass and the rye grass, about a 50-50 mix. And what we noticed was very little of the, the legumes were coming through at that point in time. Um, and then the last picture on the to the right is from the third harvest that was in uh, late October in Marshfield. And predominantly that was almost all ryegrass and a small amount of the uh, legumes. So a very lush type of uh, forage. As far as yields across the, uh, the first, for the first harvest we have that data complete. The, at, with just the sorghum sedan grass, we yielded about one to one and a half tons of dry matter uh, of uh, forage. And then the second cutting, we had about uh, a ton of dry matter and we're still working on that third harvest. So that's the typical what we've seen in previous work um, as well. Next slide, Maria. Thank you. And then to, to really bring this home to the lactating cow side, we wanted to evaluate this mix in uh, a lactating cow feeding trial. So we had a, a large field established at the uh, Marshfield uh, Research Station. Uh, you can see on the uh, left side in the upper pictures, those are uh, photos of the, the field uh, from the sink and harvest. So we took that forage that was harvested and then we ensiled it for four weeks. And we are currently in a feeding trial where we're, we're feeding that in comparison to a, an alfalfa uh, haylage uh, mix, uh, mixed ration. So that's a, the ration consists of about 35% corn silage, 20% uh, of the haylage, either the cocktail mix or the alfalfa silage and then the remaining would be the concentrate. So we're in the, in the middle of that study currently. And for that, we're evaluating the data stability of those four, of those diets. So we're looking at fiber data stability. Um, and then we're also looking at greenhouse gas emissions. So looking at methane and, and carbon dioxide emissions from those cows uh, that are eating those two diets. Uh, also, we'll get an idea of feed efficiency um, from uh, using the individual feeding gates, as you can see on the, the bottom. So. All right, with that, I think is Joel on? We're actually gonna, we'll come back to Joel. We're, we're gonna make a little adjustment on the fly. Okay, so. I'll, I'll, uh, next. I can take it from here, Matt, thanks so. Oh, okay, yeah, thanks <laughs> As you all know, like this is what we've been living through for the last uh, couple of years. So we're just just trying to lighten the mood in here, and uh, we'll get Joel Peterson from UW River Falls logged in in a second. Um, but the uh, but before we do that, I am going to welcome Z Shen Fu from UW Platteville. And let me get to his slides here. Just one second. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Maria. Uh, my name is Jiajun Fu, and today I'm going to talk about the wood template ceramic membranes for dairy waste water treatment. And I would first acknowledge the Dairy Innovation Hub for the financial support. And I also want to thank the Pioneer Farm at UW Platteville to provide the details of the, of the waste water in the dairy uh, industry. And this, this project is collaborated between me and Dr. Eduardo Rubino. And both of us are assistant professors in mechanical en engineering at UW Platteville. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, I want to first give you some background of the waste water in, par in the dairy industry. So I would use the photos that I took from the Pioneer Farm to show you the details. So if you look at the figure on the, on the top left, that we need a lot of water you know, to, to flush the ground in the dairy center uh, to make sure the plant is clean. And we also need those, waste, those water uh, to reduce the temperatures for the cows in the summertime. And after we have the dairy products, we also need, we also need the water to process, those, uh, to process the dairy products. So with about uh, roughly 150 cows in the dairy center uh, in, the, in the pioneer farm, it generates over 3 million gallons of waste water each year. And those waste water also have very high level of pollutants. And if you look at the figure uh, I took from the pioneer farm and uh, look at the figure in the, in, the, in the center top, we can clearly see those waste water are very dirty. And meanwhile, those water, those waste water has very, has very high level of the suspended uh, solids, and it's, and roughly it can gen, it can generate a full truck of those solids every one or two weeks in the summertime, and uh, the storage of those waste water can significantly influence the surrounding environment. And meanwhile, if we can do some treatment on those waste water. And if we can recycle those with the water, it can save a lot of money to pay the, to pay the water bills. So next slide. So we know that we can use the ceramic membranes to treat the waste the water. However, the manufacturing of the ceramic membranes are very complicated and therefore has very high cost. And here we introduce a, 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 a more simple method that we use the wood template method to produce the ceramic membranes. Next slide. And uh, if you and, and the reason that we use the wood template is because of the intrinsic microstructure of the wood template. So look at the spanning electron microscope from the center from the from the center top. That's how the microstructure of the wood template looks like. So it has a lot of long channels along the green directions. And we want to use those channels to treat the, to, 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 uh, to alert the, the flowing behavior, the flowing behaviors of those with the water. So with that, we turn those with the template into the ceramic membranes. So look at the figure on the bottom right. That's the sky, that's a sky electron microscope of the ceramic membranes. In the, in the with the ceramic membranes, we can have, we maintain the long channels along the, along the growing directions. In the meanwhile, those membranes are highly porous. So with those, this unique microstructure, and also with the, and also with the unit, with the pre-drilled holes, we can have the with the water flow along the growing direction of the tree in the meanwhile, because of the poor structure, we can have the waste, we can have the water permeate perpendicularly with the green direction of the green uh, perpendicular with the long channels. In those permeated water, we call the filtrated water, which is supposed to have very low level of pollutants. Next slide. So in order, to, uh, in order to use this processed ceramic membranes, we develop an experimental setup in the, in the lab. And this setup, it includes the, the, the pump, the pressure valve, the pressure gauge, and also the flow meter. So with that, we can easily control the flow rate and also the pressure on the ceramic membranes. And we can also adjust and optimize the microstructure of the ceramic membranes during the processing. So, so with those all with all of these variables, we are hoping that we can continue increase the efficiency of the, uh, the of the treatment of those ceramic membranes. And we will we'll focus on the characterizations of the treat, treated water including the chemical oxygen demand, the biological oxygen demand, the total suspended solids, and also the turbidity. 
And we are also, and we are hoping that we can develop both fundamental research related to the permeate behavior of the water and also the, uh, and also optimizing the microstructure of the ceramic membranes. And we will also develop applied research of how to, uh, how to adapt those ceramic membranes in the dairy waste water treatment in, for dairy industry. And, uh, and hopefully we can develop a, a, a with the water treatment plant in the pioneer farm using the ceramic membranes we have, we have, we have developed. And uh, thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're still trying to get our last speaker um, logged on. And again, as you know, these things happen. And um, so I'm going to start with a couple of questions um, to kind of keep us going. And, you know, maybe we'll get Joel on the line here. But I'll go to uh, Zishen, um, since you were just speaking. Is this process, you know, feasible or affordable at scale? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. So if, if you look at the figure, and especially on the process, so we start from the wood, wood block, and we pre-drill some holes on the, block, on the wood block, and we, 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 did, we, we changed the size, and we also did some chemical and physical treatment on those wood template so that, we can, so that, we, so that it's feasible to turn into a large-scale tubular ceramic membranes. Yes, I think the, uh, yes, uh, the, the answer is yes. That's a very good question. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll go to I'll go to Matt next. Hopefully, Matt, you're still um, on. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what these forage mixtures do. Um, I guess related to you know lac lactation cow diet. So I guess specifically, you know, do they change from cutting to cutting? And, you know, I guess, what can you say about the fertility and feeding rates, stuff like that? Yeah, thanks, Maria. So, yeah, they do change quite a bit from cutting to cutting, as I mentioned. The first cutting is mostly the sorghum sedan uh, grass that will predominate. Usually it's 95 to 100 percent of that is what you harvest. So that's going to be usually higher in fiber. Um, then your, your uh, next few cuttings, which are generally going to be per mostly ryegrass and, and clover. Um, so as you, your cuttings progress from first, second, third, you're usually going to get um, higher protein content, maybe lower fiber content as you get into those second, third cuttings. So you get higher quality, typically, especially with the ryegrass, is going to be very high data stability uh, forage. So it, it does change, and you've got to work with that uh, with your nutritionists to, to optimize the use of this, uh, these forage mixtures. Um, so it, usually you're going to want to store these in separate, uh, either in uh, storage structures or bags. Um, otherwise, you could mix it in with your other haylages, but you, really, you would lose some of the quality advantages you might get from ryegrass or those legumes, which are really high, high forage quality. Um, as far as the fertility, for all of our plots, we uh, fertilize those in between each uh, cutting, uh, had 45 pounds of, of nitrogen and uh, was it seven or eight pounds of sulfur that we applied to each cutting. Um, so it does require quite a bit of nitrogen because they're grasses. Um, even if you have that legume in the mix, the, the legumes aren't really contributing nitrogen at that point. Um, what a lot of producers like this mix, why they like this mix is because you can put uh, manure on it in between each cutting. So it allows you to use some of your, your uh, manure throughout the growing season instead of having to just do it, say, in spring and then again in fall. So it allows you to use some of that manure on your growing so a big advantage to this, to this type of forage mixture because it can withstand some um, application. 
Thanks, Matt. Um, we've got another question for you um, coming from the chat. Can you talk a little bit about, or I guess, what have you seen in drought tolerance from the cocktail mix in comparison to alfalfa? That's a good question. I, we obviously didn't have, uh, well, one of the sites had a, a, did have dry conditions. Um, I think that was up in um, Zilcano County. So it was, yeah, I think the producer was able to get two cuttings of the forage mix only this, this year after that. So they released a reduced yield predominantly again in that first cutting was Southern Sedan and then they had to wait another I think two months before they could get in their harvest off. So uh, drought really probably in, inhibits the growth of the the cool the cool season grasses like the rye grass and then the legumes. Those would definitely be uh, the the species that would be affected. The Southern Sedan grass is generally very drought tolerant. So that would probably have good regrowth at, even during a, a drought condition. So but that's something to consider with the forage mixture that you're gonna, even in drought, you're gonna get some variability from cutting to cutting. It's not drought, the whole mixture is not drought tolerant though. The ryegrass won't be highly affected by, by drought. Under our condition, Marshfield, where we had very good moisture throughout the season, the rye did ex exceptionally well. Um, so, great, thanks, Matt. I guess um, one more question before we um, actually, you know what? I Joel is here, um, and I know he just got logged in, but I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to to uh, Joel Peterson. And um, if we have some time for q and I'll, I'll come back to you, Matt. So um, continue to hang out. But um, with that, I just wanna welcome Dr. Joel Peterson. Hello, thank you, Maria. Yeah, apologize for the um, mix up on my end. I, I must have dragged my calendar meeting to tomorrow. So I have it on the calendar for tomorrow. Um, so in any case, um, my name is Joel Peterson, um, professor and department chair in agricultural engineering. And the project um, that I'll be discussing is updating manure nutrient values in SNAP Plus, which uh, recently got started this past summer. Um, next slide. All right, so uh, SNAP Plus is Wisconsin's nutrient management planning software. Um, and it's used to prepare nutrient management plans in accordance with particularly NR NRCS standard 590. And it can help to meet uh, Wisconsin nutrient um, and natural resources code 151. So those good, um, those nutrient management plans really require accurate characterization of nutrient content in manure, in animal manure. So as we all know, part of the planning process involves um, reducing the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, um, and other nutrients that make their way to our um, water bodies. And so supplying accurate manure volumes or characterizing those manure volumes um, and nutrient content is important to have a good plan. And so those Nutri that nutrient content and volumes can be supplied through testing. Um, and certainly that is the, the preferred method is to actually perform nutrient testing on those manure results or on that manure and using um, those results in your plan. Um, you know, every producer, even, even if they're using a fairly standard diet, there are differences in diet um, which lead to differences in manure nutrient content. So if there are not um, nutrient uh, samples that have been done, then SNAP Plus has the ability or has default values for those animal nutrient content. Um, and those default values haven't been updated in about 30 years. And 
you know, over, over the course of the last 30 years, there have been uh, marked changes in both productivity and diet. And I'm going to really, you know, for purposes of this talk, really just focus on dairy. But of course, across the animal landscape, um, there have been changes in productivity and diet. Uh, next slide. All right, so the objectives of this problem, uh, project are to first update those median values. Um, the UW Soil and Forage Lab, they process um, a lot of uh, manure samples for nutrient value, and so we're gonna use the last several years of those data to update uh, the median nutrient concentration. Um, and then the part of the, the, those default values that were established 30 years ago, a lot of those, those values were established using equation-based estimates. So either using a regression-based estimate or based on the amount of calories that an animal consumes, um, that the, the number of calories that are used in the animal's production um, to grow and produce milk, and then hence excreted. And so there's kind of a nutrient or mass balance that is done. So those equations um, can be used or were used to estimate those um, default values. So we're going to compare the lab data to the equation-based estimates um, and consider productivity and dietary changes. On the right-hand side, you see um, how average milk production in the United States, this is not just Wisconsin, but it's in across the United States, how average milk production has increased over the last 30 years. And it's been a steadily, you know, that line shows you it's been a steady increase. And um, certainly manure volume and nitrate, nit nutrient excretion is directly correlated to average milk production. So that's one of the key indicators or key correlates that's used to estimate um, both manure volume and nutrient excretion values. Um, and then in the lower right, you see food and residual use of distillers grains. Um, that's, that's one of the big dietary changes that have been, that, that's occurred in the last 30 years. So the, the prevalence of distillers grains in um, what I'm showing there is across several different um, animal species, hogs, uh, beef, and dairy. But dairy is typical of what you're seeing in the lower right-hand corner there. So um, distiller's grains use a higher, or there is a higher uh, percent of both nitrogen and phosphorus in that feed. And so by extension, there's a higher concentration of um, nitrogen and phosphorus in the manure. So we'll use, use these data to update using those equ equation-based approaches um, to update um, the default values and compare them to the lab data. And lastly, we're gonna do the same thing for both confined and grazing animals, dairy animals. And so our hope is that these uh, more accurate nutrient estimates will lead to better plans and better management and ultimately a cleaner environment. So that's kind of a, a 30,000 foot overview of the project. Thanks, Joel. Um, we do have uh, time for one question. Well, maybe two, we'll see, we'll see how we do here. We have three minutes-ish. Um, so Joel, you, you kind of hit on it a little bit at the end, but what, you know, I guess what role do you think your project could possibly play in, you know, water quality and regulatory efforts going forward? Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, the easy answer is, is that if you look at that bottom um, statement, is that, um, you know, our water quality impairments and so forth, um, in order to alleviate some of those impairments, I mean, the reason we have nutrient management plans is to, you know, either reduce or eliminate um, 
the amount of fertilizer um, and manure that is leaving the landscape uh, and making its way into our, our water bodies. Um, and to do, you know, for the, the flip side of that would be to do more or better uh, manure or nutrient management on the landscape. You know, if, if manure nutrient content is off by 10 to 15%, you know, maybe we're under applying um, manure. You know, when, we're, when we think we're getting 100 pounds per acre, maybe we're only getting 90 pounds per acre. So it could lead to better crop productivity or forage productivity as well. So both increases, uh, hopefully better water quality, but ba maybe better um, soil management as well. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all three of our speakers.